EAC meeting. We're very happy to have Dr. Robert Traver here to talk to us about stormwater. He's from Villanova University and he's going to share some of his expertise with us. Um, do you guys have any introductory material if you want to jump right in? Okay, great. Well, I think what we wanted to, to sort of get started on is just kind of a big picture overview of what's happening with stormwater management in our community and, and how we ought to be thinking about these things. Mike? I understand. Um, that's a, thanks for the invitation. I mean, obviously, I always try to take advantage when anybody wants to talk stormwater. Uh, I want to start a little different direction, though. Um, I want to talk about flood risk because flood risk and stormwater really work together. And what I mean by that is part of, this, part of these lessons come when Katrina hit. I spent four or five years working on Katrina and what caused it. Then after that, we basically, some of the committee got together who worked on this and some others and basically said, has anybody ever listens to all these issues and the millions of studies that have been done? So we spent another two or three years of free time working on some reports from the American Society of Civil Engineers, which you could download for free. And a lot of the lessons are applicable anywhere. And some of them you've been working on. Uh, like for an example, identifying the problem is a huge issue. Identifying what the risk is. That is a huge issue and it's amazing how many people don't know about it. Um, and so, and by the way, we don't use, don't like to use the word protection anymore because it's a lie. You know, we're not going to be able to protect against everything. You know, so what you're trying to do is mitigate the risk, minimize the risk. So try to, you know, set a goal. Is the 10 year, do you want no flooding during the 10 year storm or a 50 year storm or whatever you're going to hit and see what's possible. As part of that, you know, I looked through, thank you for sending me some of the materials that you guys have been doing here. I'm not, I'm no longer a Radnor resident. I moved out about 25 years ago when I could afford to buy a house. Um, but um, like for an example, one of the things we're looking at is I noticed that a lot of your work is based upon some individual storm events where you had records. I would really recommend you sometime get, do a continuous flow simulation using like 30 years of rainfall and taking a look because that gives you a much better picture of where it floods and where it doesn't how it floods. Now, one of the problems with that, unfortunately, is most of the rainfall records have like hour periods of precipitation. Um, but Philadelphia Airport, you can get like 40 years of rainfall record. And it's not that hard anymore, and probably the same models here consultants were doing, and run it through and compare. So you can really see a little bit more where the different areas of flooding are. And a lot of people are starting to play around. Uh, we just have a publication on this we've been working on in stormwater and looking at climate change and resilience. And you can certainly increase some of the intensities within that record and try to mimic some of the future issues. It's not that hard to do anymore. Philadelphia is doing a lot of that right now within their own systems. Um, so that would give you a better picture of the system. And also, I noted in some of your documents you said you didn't want to make any culverts bigger. Well, sometimes culverts can cause flooding. So that way you could at least play to see if you got a little larger culvert to see A, if it's going to reduce flooding, or B, if it's going to cause a problem downstream. So I wouldn't, I wouldn't automatically throw out changes in culvert sizes. I would definitely investigate it first, because you don't want to cause the problem for going downstream. And also, it might help you in looking at if you did routing through some of your detention basins that you're retrofitting. I know there is a big concern about not touching the volume. Well, most of these were built too big. So maybe you could touch some of the volume and, uh, and maybe make some of the holes smaller or something like that. So I do think that would be something I would recommend. Um, really, what we're really looking at flood risk these days is you've got to take advantage of everything. You've got to take a look at all the tools in the toolbox. Um, volume, obviously, is a big one. But also zoning, uh, number of car parking spaces you have or you know, setbacks or uh, impervious surface, anything that increases impervious surface or causes a problem, should really look at it to see if it's the best, if it's something that should be kept the same. And I know there's reasons for having a number of parking spaces or minimum street widths for turning around fire trucks and things like that. But 
It's not a bad idea if it has not been reviewed for a long time to look at some of those things like that. Um, so right off the bat, that was kind of my first impression. And you got to use almost be very aggressive with your tools. You just mentioned you got a you got a stormwater fee. I know Villanova complains to me about it. <laughs> I shouldn't say that they really don't. Um, um, but I mean, there is a, you know there is a fee in that system that can be used as incentives for maintaining existing distances to reduce their impervious surface. Um, it's um, that's what Philadelphia has tried to do with their water uh, usage fee. On obviously targeted applications. But the nice thing about doing a continuous simulation model, it's a little easier to see what the effect of that's going to be. And unfortunately, you're probably also going to find doing this, there's some areas you cannot help, which is not uh, something nobody ever wants to hear, whether it's New Orleans or New Jersey Shore or Wayne. You know, there are some things you're just going to, and so maybe it's a, a smart thing to do is see what you can do about improve return from the flooding. All right, figure out what you can do to get back into operations. If there's an area, you just know it's going to be risky. Or maybe the zoning should it take into account for future development. So it's, uh, and th these are things that nobody ever wants to tackle, which, which is the big problem. We had a lot of discussions that we should take a look at areas that were um, not able to be saved, and this was much more severe than what we've seen in Wayne, don't misunderstand this. But if you take a look at an area in New Orleans that could not be saved in a flood, then maybe if the next time there's a flood, you do not rebuild on that particular part or New Jersey Shore or wherever. Sure. Yeah. Um, so, I mean, those are some things that I would just put off the bat. You do have to be aggressive because it's not an easy problem to solve. So is, is that realistic that if you have an area that's prone to flooding to convince property owners to not rebuild? I mean, I don't think we have any flooding so You're substantial gonna, that people are rebuilding. But in yeah. theory, if someone got flooded out and required to rebuild, is that a, even something well, we could Well, FEMA's address? rules and regulations are if a place is flooded out multiple times, then they do not rebuild. Now, they don't do that very often. Darby is an example. Darby Borough, after the flood, what year is that, 90s? Or 2001? I, I remember one in that um, was Floyd in the 90s. Yeah, 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 Floyd, yeah. Floyd. They had a whole area they did not rebuild and they turned it into a park. Mm -hmm. uh, there are some areas in the Mississippi, there are some cities that were relocated after the uh, 1990s flooding. So it's obviously the political will, it's tough. And I would not, I'm not suggesting that necessarily for Wayne, don't misunderstand me. The levels of flooding I saw were horrible, but they're not, it didn't look like it was life threatening as much. So it's, uh, but it's, it's an issue. I mean, it's, uh, and, and the political will is usually not there. Well, I think it's been brought up, Rob, but the current homeowners in the flooded areas, they want to be paid oh, yeah. full market price, and the township, there's just no yeah. way. But won't flood insurance or lack of or the cost of begin to discourage some of these people from rebuilding? It doesn't seem to. I mean, I'm not an expert on that as much. So I'll keep away from that one a little bit. But it's, um, I mean, that we've had discussions where flood insurance program, does that encourage people to stay in flooded areas? Mm -hmm. But, you know, if, you're, if it's your family home, you've been there, you know, your heart goes out for those type of situations. So I would say that's kind of the last thing I would do. And, you know, it would be more, nuisance flooding would not be a criteria at all. I mean, I'm talking about life-threatening uh, mm -hmm. flooding type. So the whole building is not washed away. Um, in terms of the zoning and building issues you mentioned earlier, uh, I know in Villanova there were some projects with impervious or pervious concrete. Is that a viable solution for, like, say, someone's redoing a road, building a parking lot? Are, are, there, um, so, uh, are there pervious building materials that are economically cost effective? Well, economically is rebuilding something. I mean, so if you're putting in a pervious pavement, you have to have infiltration underneath or a slow release in the rock bed. That's usually the difference in cost. Pervious pavement doesn't cost that much more. But I would never build it without a very strong maintenance program to include a vacuum, uh, one of the new vacuum street sweepers that really suck it in. 
We have a site of Villanova that's failed recently. It's about 10, 12 years old, but it finally failed because our vacuum street sweeper isn't that good. It's an old one. Um, so it's, uh, I think pervious pavements work. I don't, they're not my first choice, uh, but they're, well, you think about it, we have a lot of studies where we're finding sediments in the surface, and it catches the, water, the pollutants at the surface. And when you suck them out, you're getting those pollutants out. But also, that shows if you don't do that, it's gonna, it is going to clog. And it would, I would rather put it in areas where you're not going to have as much traffic or it's not going to be as dirty. Um, on the stormwater, you know, just looking at uh, it's the high impervious surfaces are the enemy. And anything that can be done for reducing volume in those areas or slowing down the flows. And that's obviously what you've been looking at. And combining it with your pollution prevention requirements is a good thing. But, um, you know, so high pockets of impervious are always something you want to look at. Dr. Traer, how have the models for kind of managing these things changed over the years? You mentioned climate change. I imagine that has an impact on the statistical data, if nothing else. Right. But, um, I understand, too, there's a lot of change that's happened in the design of things like basins and culverts, and, and I hear all these technical terms. Are those things that have really significantly shifted over the years? Uh, we're trying. Um, uh, okay. A lot of people underestimate or overestimate or underestimate infiltration. When I say underestimate, I mean, basically, if you get a quarter inch an hour of infiltration capacity, you're going to get very good results. A lot of places do not allow you to build infiltration devices until you have a half inch per hour infiltration rate, which is most of my sites would never have been built, and they've been working for 15 years. Um, I do think things have changed a lot, uh, or should be changing a lot. Uh, we are under contract writing the new stormwater management manual, and we're trying to put as much of the research in on this. Um, and parts of it, you know, like for an example, if you have a, we had a conversation before the camera was on, but if you look at the NRCS categories, you've heard of A, B, C, and D soil. Uh, C soil, we've had plenty of research at Villanova by PhDs working on real data that if you're in the upper half of the C soil, it's fine. You can infiltrate, you can build, you should not have a problem. If you got lower than that, then you have to add or help. Um, excuse me, I don't know. Uh, but basically it's, um, so we're also trying to de design more toward, co toward continuous simulation. The design storm for stormwater, when we're looking at an inch of water, is ridiculous. Um, to really get the benefit of green infrastructure, you need the continuous cycle that shows the evaporation, the evapotranspiration, the recovery, and the infiltration. Uh, you could probably have designed for ponding for a week and a half, and it won't be a problem, because that's only going to happen once a year. So I mean, the, some of these design factors are still left over from flooding. Now, I'm not going to pretend we're going to be able to get all of those in, the new, in our, our approaches, but we are trying to give more flexibility to really take advantage of what is on your site. So if you have decent soil on your site, we want you to get credit for that soil in your design to enable you to build a better design. And that's um, currently a lot of the methods don't do that very well. Gotcha. Thank you. That's great. Um, we wanted to talk a little bit about potential opportunities for collaboration. I don't want to put you on the spot here, but oh, I wonder if, if there, well, sure, <laughs> since you're here and uh, we're on camera. Uh, um, no, but, you know, as we kind of talk through planning some of these projects that are on the list um, of, you know, potential funding and as the, the BOC kind of rec wrestles with all these things, um, are there ways that we could involve the community? involve some of your students maybe involve you know other organizations uh, that would help us get a little bit of leverage out of you know the fact that we're already funding a project why don't we do some additional measurements some additional study whatever it may be yeah problem is most of our students are engaged employed on research contracts and it's actually illegal for me to pay them for doing anything else however villanova has something called a saint thomas of villanova day in october every year 
And basically, we've built many rain gardens every year for the city of Philadelphia. And the way that works is uh, actually about two-thirds of the student body does projects all over the Philadelphia area. Done a lot of like soup kitchens or painting elementary schools in poor areas of Philadelphia. Now, Radnor's not exactly a poor area. But you but, come to the community vegetable garden every <laughs> year, and yeah. it's invaluable. Yeah. Because they're young and strong, and we're old yeah. and weak. <laughs> but what we could do very easily is, if you have like a planning project or a reconfiguration, mm -hmm. think about something you can take about six or eight hours, six hours of work with about 30 students. And what Villanova has done is they've had a lot of donations from uh, Lowe's, gives all the tools. Yeah. Um, if you give us a plant list, what Villanova will do is contact some uh, different uh, nurseries. Now, we might not get at your exact plant list, so they do try to do some wheeling dealing within the money that's donated. But what they'll do is they'll try to get, it's usually in October, so it's the what's left over. But basically, um, you can get a bunch of plants. We'll have the, all you have to, and what I would recommend if you're going to do, if we're going to do this, try to get a lot of your citizens out there at the same time, because I think it's better for our students. And you know, we might show up with about 10 or 15 shovels and rakes and gloves and lunch, and they'll have a prayer session at the end. And uh, but you'll be able to get a lot of work done. We've done this, the city of Philadelphia. We'll probably do it again this fall. But we, I mean, it's not just the engineers. Well, actually, it's kind of funny. They want to get close by projects so the basketball team can, can get out there, too. <laughs> so, I mean, basically, um, you know, we'll get alumni in the area. You might be able to get, it depends on the site, you know, might be able to get 20 or 30 people out there for six hours. That's quite a workload right there. So, besides rain gardens, what would you recommend in terms of, BMPs or, or stormwater projects that we could implement, like let's say we're on volunteer labor, some minor township resources. What's the, what's the good targeted project that we could have that would be maintainable over the long term that would actually be effective? Well, I like rain gardens, yeah. to be honest with okay. you. I mean, it's, uh, I find that the green is more resilient. Uh, we, we have a site at Villanova that's been there 15 years. And if we cut out the grasses every year and rake them out, it has not declined in performance in 15 years. It's actually, the same rates are even, even higher. Um, you basically have, uh, now the problems you could have is, if you have a lot of salts coming in, you have to be very careful about the plants. They're not gonna be the prettiest in the world. Um, but uh, I like those as one. Reuse is another one. Um, I'm trying not to have any conflict of interest here, but I really do like our Lancaster project about using the HVAC system for capturing and reusing water. That is very innovative. One of the hardest problems with reuse is using the water. And, um, you know, dorms in the summertime, we don't have as many students, though they, we have enough for the air conditioning and eating. So, I mean, basically, in some of the lab buildings, you're not going to have people flushing the toilets. So the reuse is tough, but I would think that would be a very sustainable solution for businesses, if you if they wanted to, if they have to upgrade their systems, um, so, so that would be using storm rainwater for HVAC systems. Yeah. Oh, yeah. Okay. So basic capture it off the roof, so you don't have all the chlorides and and the small stuff in the in the in the runoff, and uh, basically use it for the HVAC. It's amazing, especially if if institutions how much water they use. Um, pervious pavement. I like pervious pavement. It's not my first solution, and I don't, I don't like it where I like people putting little trails in the woods. That doesn't make any sense because you can't maintain it. You have to be able to maintain it, especially in low-trafficked areas. Um, Philadelphia has deep paving parties mm -hmm. where they go in, they'll break up the, the blacktop of all the residents come out, throw it into a truck, and so if you have areas that are pavement that you don't need, that's another option. And if you have to take a look at it. On new development, you're just breaking even. So what you got to do is go back to existing impervious surface and see what you can do without reducing that load. Unfortunately, I think that area doesn't go into the dark. Yes, it does. Never mind. I have to check my maps. I know our rain garden is at the headwaters of the Darby. 
uh, that we built a long time ago. Um, so, I mean, you look at, unfortunately, volume, you only got to get rid of it by infiltration, evapotranspiration, or reuse. I mean, you can detain it in slow release if you have bad soils, if you can't infiltrate or you have, uh, if you have um, uh, polluted uh, soil or something like that. But you really don't have a lot of choices. But I always look at it, if I can build a rain garden and make it look like a, the first inch doesn't come out of that site. I like green roofs, but obviously it doesn't work very well for residential. Or retrofits, it's tough. Uh, we had a, a prairie restoration project we we're trying to convince the township to implement at some parks. Uh, does that have any uh, benefit for in terms of stormwater? Can you get r roadway water onto it? No. Well, th this particular one, the, the area we found for it was in the middle of a, a slope in, in a park, so it wasn't doing a whole lot for that. Yeah. But, I mean, it's going to help in that area, but the best thing would be to find something like that with the impervious surface coming to it, where you can right. put some curb cuts and things like that. Where it's kind of funny, we're actually doing a study for Philadelphia water and curb cuts. I find a lot of people build curb cuts for rain gardens and water doesn't go in them. <laughs> so it's uh, That happens. That happens. So I've seen designs in parking lots and the curbs are so high that the water won't go into the rain garden. There's just no yeah. access. I think the parking lot, it's not in Radnor, in Tredyffrin where um, Acme and Kmart is. Is there a little restaurant next to it? Could be. It's in there. There's one that way that I, I have pictures of I use at times, <laughs> including one near where I live, too. Yeah, just so that's, I think, one of the biggest issues as I've been sort of thinking about it, looking at it with mm -hmm. gardens and Ready 100 and climate change and the whole thing. I mean, for, for an example, you do have a fee. You can use that, uh, if you, like for an example, banks probably don't have that much traffic. I know several banks now where I live, I'm in the hill boonies a little bit, but they have, uh, a lot of the banks seem to have pervious pavement, because mm -hmm. nobody goes to a bank anymore, but they still need parking lot for, the, for people. So having some kind of incentive uh, to help uh, retrofits of existing is probably one of your best things you can do. And that reinforces what I was thinking. I think zoning in Radnor, which came in in 1968, and it really has not been upgraded, a little here and a little there, a tweak mm -hmm. and a tweak. I think um, Radnor's zoning really needs to be changed to give credit for, like they did with Villanova, smaller footprint allowed to go up. Where are we going to put solar panels? Mm -hmm. What are we going to do? I mean, it just, it, you run up again, well, we're not zoned for that. Well, we're not zoned for that. Yeah. And that's going to be a ticklish mountain to climb because yeah. there are a lot of people, it, you have to almost stop development while you rewrite the zoning code. And I think the township yeah. gets nervous about stopping development I mean, to take a year to rewrite a zoning code and a lot of money to hire people to do it. Yeah. That was, and building codes. Yes. So, I mean, if you're in an area that's getting flooded, you know, do you have a different building code? First mm -hmm. floor elevation being raised, mm -hmm. uh, those type of things. Mm -hmm. So I think the Corps of Engineers put out a neat graphic. It was like, here's your flood risk. Reduce your risk. You know, you can zoning codes, building codes, uh, green infrastructure. And the levees was the last one on the list because no, that's a very dangerous solution. Uh, but it's a, don't worry, we're not doing levees in Wayne, I don't think. <laughs> but I mean, basically going down the list. Mm -hmm. And uh, so that wasn't just me that's saying this. That's great, thank you. Do you have any favorite resources that uh, our community members can access to learn more about rain gardens and some of these other ideas? Are, are there organizations out there that you're aware of that, that we can turn to? to oh, there's a to lot. Of American stuff. Rivers has some good stuff. I mean, uh, North Carolina State has some very good stuff about individual homeowner mm -hmm. uh, rain gardens. I just would not use their planning list because <laughs> obviously we're in a different area than North Carolina State. Uh, Minnesota is a very good stormwater manual for the technical. Philadelphia Water Department stormwater manual is excellent. They've done They've done a very nice job on that. 
speaking of Philadelphia, I know from speaking to uh, Carol Albright about mm -hmm. a lot of the Philadelphia, um, the curb cuts, and the, the they have the, um, I don't know what you call them, between the sidewalk and the curb, there's a lot of uh, stormwater infiltration ditches. Would it be worth speaking to someone from the Philadelphia Water Department about some of these projects? Because they've obviously been imp implementing this stuff in an urban oh, area sure. for a long time. Sure. Is there anyone there who might be a good, a good contact? We have a resource us? right in our township. Oh, yeah, who's that? Marissa Barletta yeah. works for the Philadelphia Water Company. There you go. Well, don't tell her that because she's asked to live in Philadelphia. She works for Philadelphia. Uh, Unless she's she's uh, a consultant. Consultant, uh, okay. And, but she lives on Garrett <laughs> Avenue, and she's very interested, and I think Marissa might be a good hometown resource to tap into. They have done a really good job at looking at the whole picture. Yes, they have. Inspecting them, building them maintaining them and uh, they're really f focusing and you know be on truth advertising we're doing research for Philadelphia Water Department mm -hmm. and uh, I'm not in charge of one of my colleagues is but they're they're very forward-thinking and uh, they've developed some programs they're using at-risk youth employing them and building them into being a green instructor for maintenance so they're pretty impressive some of the things they're doing that's really cool that's great Quick question too on the sure. uh, pervy uh, pavement. I mean, I bought a house and I have a concrete patio. I mean, if I have to redo it, is that something that would be an option for me, or is it more? I think I think it would be better to put a rain garden next to it. Okay. I mean, unless you're going to planning on every six months running a very strong vacuum street sweeper over it. No, I barely do my house. Yeah. <laughs> well, in that case, then I would not. Okay. I mean, I would probably go for a green structure first, like the rain gardens. Mm -hmm. I have to laugh. I have a lot of people saying they're so hard to maintain. And I got a picture of a guy trying to mow one at a, at a shopping center near me where the, the green area is this wide, his mower is this wide, trying to figure out how to mow the thing. <laughs> and so I can guarantee we do less maintenance on our rain gardens in Villanova than you would normally mm -hmm. for mowing on these sites. Um, green roofs I like a lot too, but they're also very expensive. And you're only going to do that if you're going to pave every inch of your property. And uh, so, you know, my preference, and I do like permeable pavements as part of the solution, but I wanted to have within an area where you have an organization that's in charge of maintenance. Okay, right. King of Pressure Mall, I can trust them maybe to run that. Mm -hmm. Rob, isn't maybe not having as much lawn and having more plantings will absorb more water? Because lawns are almost treated as an impervious surface. Yeah, I mean, I, the one thing I would say is, though, I'd want to get the pavement water on there. Yes. Yeah. We had a student a long time ago, and he'd actually did his master's at, a master's at Drexel, and he stayed on for his PhD at Villanova. And I had hired him, and I liked to study so much, I figured I got to hire this guy. And he did a study on Valley Creek, and he did models, and this was before we even started looking at infiltration. But he looked at model Valley Creek in every detention base, and he went out and visited I'm not going to mention all the problems, the broken ones that he found. And then he took out all the green and just did the asphalt and got the same answer. This yeah. because, for the small storms, mm -hmm. for the small storms, because, I mean, all the runoff is pretty much from the pavement or the compacted impervious. <laughs> so it's just, especially when you're looking at that, and in this figure, if you're taking an inch out of a bigger rainstorm, it's going to be less, it's going to reduce that problem as well. Are you finding, this is a little more technical, but for the bioretention basins, you said you have some that are 15 years old, on, or the rain gardens on Villanova? 2001. So are you finding that you had to reconstruct them nope. in between, and, and they're still? Never done anything to it. The only thing we've done is every year facilities, and they started this, and we just never stopped them. And we didn't ask them to. They cut down all the grasses. Where ours, there's some bushes and a lot of grasses. So they cut out and rake out the grasses, and that's it. A lot of people are having problems uh, when they, like if they put mulch down every year and they never take any out and it solidifies. So we've never added mulch or anything. Now there are some at Villanova, I actually have a meeting for the facility directors that have some problems, but it's, so I'm helping them change their maintenance practices, and Villanova will change those uh, to, so they work better. So now, Again, you've got a lot of, if you go in and abuse them, you do a construction site and throw in two tons of mud in there, 
-hmm. The surface is going to just fail and you're going to have to dig it out. Right. Um, we are working with PennDOT on two sites near I-95 that have failed. But then we have pictures of the equipment compacting it during construction. And what happened is they tried, this, the sides are so steep, they threw so much bolts, it all sloughed in and sealed off the bottom. So really, you do need to be rigorous about inspection through, and through it's finished. And especially, and even if it's, if you're just putting grass seed around, wait a little bit until that grass. We are starting to use at Villanova on the new projects that convince our people to use what Philadelphia Water does. They open the fire hydrant, fill it up with water, and make sure they work. Pretty simple, but at least you know the water is disappearing. And it's actually not a bad practice for inspecting your own systems. Because if you're building them and depending on these systems, there are an engineering system, you do have to address them. We do have to look and check them out every once in a while. And Good stuff. Well, thank you very much. Well, thank you. Don't really appreciate your time and thank Any you. Any time, just ask me back. Thank you. Good to meet you. And, nice uh, to meet you, too. Yeah. Thanks. Thank you. We did McCrew. Yeah. Oop. speak with some township people, see if we can find a site, maybe we're somewhere where they want to put a rain garden or mm -hmm. somewhere with a stormwater issue that's not currently being addressed and suggest putting a big rain garden there with yeah. the help of Villanova. That's a great idea. Yeah, and doing a, we can throw a look at it during a storm event or making sure the water gets there. Thank you very much. Yeah, thanks for coming out. Good we'll seeing be in you. Touch. Good it's to nice see you to again. Nice to see you again. Hey, nice to see you again. Come on back and visit. I love that. <laughs> Great. Fantastic. A lot of good ideas. Lots, lots to work on. And I think the idea of getting folks from the community involved is, is a really important one. And I think that's, that's key to what you did with Ready for 100, right? It's really a central part well, of the whole plan. Because then they because then they learn what it's really like and yeah. there's nothing like digging in it and then you get and in, and you become invested in it. I, there's a sense of ownership. I, we yeah. worked on the rain garden over here as well and I, that's one of the things I'm proudest of with this group because it was just a great collaboration and it was so mm -hmm. much fun. My kids were involved. You were involved, right? It was fun. Um, and it's still there and it, you, you can see the difference that it makes. So. Well, we've, the garden, the community garden at, at the Willows, we've had the Villanova students every year, and Jim's been there for some of them. It's a very powerful day, and we would get the gardeners to come. Mm -hmm. So if we had 30 Villanova students at a minimum, we'd have 15 gardeners. Mm -hmm. And they begin to talk, and they, it, the amount of energy, the amount of work mm -hmm. they did in five or six hours was positively amazing. Well, and that's the thing. You don't have to do this year round. You don't have to do it all the time. No. If we can do this on a regular basis and get that kind of energy involved, I think it, it would be tremendous. We mm -hmm. can make a lot of progress. Mm -hmm. Good, mm -hmm. well, thank you. Um, Colleen, thank you very much for doing the minutes. Um, did anybody get a chance to review those? Yes. Okay. The Board of Commissioners meeting was the 25th of February not the 28th, it's in the minutes all the way through that we passed the ready for 100 on the 28th, that's tonight. Okay. So it was the 25th of February, 25th. that was the one thing that I -C noticed. Um, and I'd be happy to make that correction and get yeah, the... I think I only said you were presenting it on the 28th, I don't think I mentioned that in the Okay. Well, that, no, because it wasn't passed last month, <laughs> but the date we were, to, it, we were to handle it was the 25th of okay. February. I'll make a note of that. And that's Thank the you, date of the adoption. Okay. Super. Um, why don't we segue right into work group reports and ready for 100? Because I think that's going to be the one we need to 
to really talk about. Again, Sarah, thank you very much for your efforts putting that together. Well, and Robin. And Robin as well. Um, I know you both were absolutely key to making that happen. So thank you and good work. Congratulations. <laughs> and if you want some entertainment, watch the commissioner's meeting. No, I haven't was, had a chance to look it, at it yet. It was item five on the list, so you wouldn't be there till. I didn't get home till quarter of one. Boy, the meeting was just horrendous. But oh, I'm anyhow, sorry to hear that. so it's been adopted. It was six to one, mm -hmm. which was fine. The next step, and I want to reassure the EAC that you're not getting all of stormwater and the plastic mm -hmm. bag and ready for 100. We're looking to develop a task force of residents, EAC overseeing it. Churches, we already have two churches. We have Villanova University, very interested, WBA, and it's, that's particularly the straws and bags. Um, Matt, the goal is for Matt and Robin and Bob to, and myself to meet with Bob Sinkowski mm -hmm. next to talk about the low hanging fruit because we can get this ready. Uh, to advocate for getting any money. We can't get money to hire an energy expert until January of 2020. And when you say money, you're talking about money directly from the township? $25,000 okay. is what we're asking for, to hire an energy expert. Now, in the meantime, because PICO has done the heat maps for the township, Sulpizio, and one of three of the public works, and I'm going to ask, I'm going to get that done next. There is low hanging fruit on efficiency that the township can begin to look at. Okay. And some of it's going to be talking to the staff and the staff changing their behavior. The biggest piece of this is people changing their behavior. The way to keep the cost down with the energy expert is for us to do a lot of outreach to residents, to schools, to you name it. Um, so that way your energy person doesn't have to, they don't have to do the public meetings that we're prepared to do that. And the first thing is um, efficiency. A suggestion has been made, I've been working very closely with Steve Clark, who's Haverford Township. He's just a great guy and he works for PICO, so it, it makes it really easy. And I need to do a lot more research about it, is to measure the carbon footprint of our own homes, of the township building, to begin to understand so when you do efficiencies, you're reducing your carbon footprint and you feel like you're making progress. And to always remember, we have until 2035. This does not have to be accomplished in a year. Um, Sarah, on the carbon footprint assessment, I know there's a sort of complicated version where you can go in and have a full you know, inspection done of your home. Is there a simpler assessment where you can answer survey questions? That's get, what I have to find out. That's what you're looking for, and okay. Part of the education, and I did it, and mine was free because I was at the expo at Haverford College mm -hmm. and Pico was there is I had an energy audit done by Pico. And a very nice young man, he was also went to the Schroden box, and I think he's doing a lot of this. He was in my home for an hour and a half. He went basement to attic. He made suggestions to me, other than changing my hot water heater, which would cost me over a thousand, my supplies to do the work myself cost me $75. Wow. And it would have cost me 38 to have him, and he gave me $45 worth of light bulbs, and he not only gave them to me, he put them in for me. <laughs> so one of the ways to address the residents of Radnor is to encourage, so one of the programs we might have is to have someone who does energy assessments to come in and it tells you exactly what can be done and how much, and again, it's efficiency. Is, is that a service okay. PICO offers to have somebody That's come in for free? service, no, well, normally it's $35. Oh, okay. 
but you can get 40 to $45 worth LED light bulbs. Well, you know, that Given might be, you. I wonder if Pico would be interested in coming to like one of the township fairs or something and setting up a table and people oh, would sign up for it there. They would do, they would do it. I and think, I, think it, I don't know, but I'm guessing if there were 30 people who heard a lecture and they all signed up, the price might go down. I actually had That's it done today by Pico. They came over and did the assessment. They were there for two hours. Mm -hmm. I paid $25 and I got $55 worth of light bulbs. For right. Free. Plus all these I mean, like little a, a things. Lists of all things, you know, the what other kinds of what other kinds of things did they suggest besides the light bulbs? Uh, I mean, they looked at insulation, some gaps that I had in the attic, some gaps in, out in the garage, a um, couple of refrigerators that I don't use that I should have unplugged that you didn't think about. Um, I have a heater out in a pond that we thought was off was not. Uh, they did a full assessment. And part of it, you know, your ductwork in the basement and it's metal on metal. Well, you go buy a roll of very heavy duct tape and you just put duct tape over that seam where there's just the tiniest gap. Right. It, and my, my house is old-ish and crummy-ish, sort of, um, between the joists and the wall, the insulation was gone. So I bought a roll of non-asbestos because I'm going to have to do it myself. And I've insulated the wall where the joists are all the way around. I mean, it, it did not cost much. And as a woman who feels self-sufficient, I could do all of it myself. Yeah. It just was me. It was, it's very, very wealth, well worthwhile. That's terrific, yeah. And it's, you know, there's so many things that I, I think if the community members were more aware of them. Sure. Um, we could make a lot of progress. I think a lot of said, it is going to be for... education, and the yeah. other issue is choosing a different energy provider. Yeah. Yeah. And that's one of the things that's encouraged. And the other is Solarize. Haverford Township Media is has Solarized, mm -hmm. and uh, Haverford Township is working on it, where you get, I think they have in Haverford Township, they now have 30 people who want to have solar panels and the price goes down. So that is something. And the bill was introduced this week, uh, House Bill 531, into the Pennsylvania legislature to be allowed to have community solar. Philadelphia's gone to community solar. 20% of their government buildings are going to be solar and the plant is in Adams County so it doesn't necessarily mean solar on your roof if they can mm -hmm. get this through right. um, and they seem to be more optimistic about it that's true uh, then it'll be legal to have community solar I didn't realize it was illegal to have it yes interesting well, it's called the fossil fuel yes. pushback yeah. <laughs> Wow. Um, Colleen, how does that tie in with the discussions you've had at the high school? Is, is there still something kind of bubbling there in terms of, um, you know, solar power? Uh, yes, actually, they, the, um, Sue Stern is now running the school board. She's president of the school board. She is so behind us. She's hiring someone who's going to be, a, I think, a director of operations, and they're looking into it. Fantastic. Yeah. That's great. So it all comes together. It will. Yes. Baby steps, one step at a Baby time. Baby steps. Mm -hmm. yeah. So I'm, I think this is going to work. It's, I took a six weeks course at uh, Central Baptist Church on plastics, and it was amazing the number of people who are into climate change or into the concept of Ready for 100, maybe not formally, but um, they're thinking that way. Uh, and it was a it was a very dynamic uh, six weeks course. So, it's very heartening to see how many people are getting involved. And I think, as with you know the plastic bag discussions, as with a lot of these other things, there are technical aspects of this that an ordinary person wouldn't necessarily know about. And I I personally find it a little bit confusing sometimes mm -hmm. and it's good to keep these conversations going so that we can uh, make sure folks are informed about the, the options and the impact great so it sounds like the the next next step is for us to get together with Bob Z and uh, talk through how we're going to get that 
right. oversight so committee together. You'll send me your availability. Mm -hmm. And Robin's in, I don't know where she is with the Sierra Club, but she comes home Sunday and Jennifer said to send Bob, and I've already initiated it, to send Bob um, some possible dates. And I was absolutely thrilled when they asked for three new vehicles and two of them are going to be um, hybrids. That's real progress. So, and he has told all, all replacement of cars where appropriate there to be hybrids. Okay, fantastic. And we'll get to electric vehicles eventually. That's great. And is the township talking about revisiting green purchasing, we, we worked on that with them a few years We're ago. We're trying to get, they're called RECs, mm -hmm. and Constellation is the provider, mm -hmm. and he they are supposed to provide to the township what portion was solar, what portion was wood, and what portion was nuclear. Um, I asked right out of the, after the first of the year, and tomorrow is the first of March, to the best of my knowledge, uh, Constellation hasn't produced it and nobody had asked them in the last six or seven years so we really don't know how yeah. much of it is alternative energy okay so time to review that again. so yeah so I will get to Bob and and, or, and Bill White because Bill White was the one who was asking for it okay terrific thank you and congratulations again that's really exciting so. it was a push. I, it was. And, uh, you know, it's a testament to the real grassroots work that you and Robin have done to, to pull this coalition together. I think it made a difference. Plus, a high proportion of the commissioners are very well aware of this. Yeah. And we had three people before we started who said absolutely. So it didn't mm -hmm. take, wasn't too hard to, and Robin and I met with each of the, we offered to meet with each commissioner mm -hmm. individually. I'm sure that made all the difference. And I think it did make a difference. Yeah. Great. Well, thank you. Um, I'm going to suggest that we um, hold off on sustainable PA certification um, unless you folks have stuff that you want to bring up with that, as well as the plastic bag and straw discussion, because I think we, we might want the full group for those things. Um, uh, happy to, to go down that road if you want, but I'm not sure I've got anything to add right now. Um, as well as voting for the chair and the vice chair, uh, that's something that I think we ought to have the full group here for. But I'll just um, reiterate what I've said before. I'm happy to continue serving if you want, but I'm also happy for somebody else to take over as chair. And I do think we need a vice chair at minimum just so that we can um, you know, the many times that I haven't been able to make a meeting, it's, it's good to have somebody else who can kind of take over the reins. And I know mm -hmm. everybody has been very graceful about doing that, um, so I, I appreciate the support, and I think it's just a good thing to, to make sure we do. Uh, I could probably do that if, if nobody else, I, you know, if somebody else wants to do it, I'm perfectly fine with it, but if you need someone to do it. Great, thank you. That. So why don't we bring that up for a, uh, an actual vote next time, and then uh, we'll ratify it. Sounds good. Good, thank you, Jim, I appreciate it. Um, we had one announcement that Sarah handed me this. There is an EAC conference in May um, at SkyTop up in the Poconos. Um, and that's available on the two web. Day. It's a two-day thing. It looks really interesting. It's being done by the, is it the Land Trust, Land Bank? Who did, whoever sponsored it last mm -hmm. year is who's sponsoring it again this year. Okay. It's a very full schedule. It certainly is. Um, and it looks like a lot of really interesting stuff. Um, so if, if folks are interested in that, I'm sure they can uh, find that information on the web. Mm -hmm. Thank you for that. Any other announcements? Okay. Um, Skip's not here, so no liaison report. Any community education notes? We're kind of talking about that the whole time here, so. Uh, maybe not worth an announcement, but the uh, stream, the Stream Science Club at Ithin sort of folded, but uh, Andrea is doing the regular Science Club, and she was wondering if she could 
access some of the equipment to integrate some of the stream science components into that. If Absolutely, that's, okay that's great. Yeah, okay. um, it's all stored in the basement here. Happy to coordinate getting that to her, or you know, if she wants me to just put her in touch with the right people, we can get that going. Okay, I think it'll be it'll come up later in the year. So okay. I'll but I'll let her know that when when she needs it, we'll get uh, we'll figure it out. That's great. Thanks. And if she has thoughts on other ways to you know use that equipment, um, let's let's hear it because I think. Uh, yeah, not doing good in the basement, right? Yeah, exactly. It's just sitting there. So yeah, yeah we've got microscopes, test kits, um, nets, lots of uh, lots of good stuff. Okay. Hip waders, good. Thank you. Um, any new business? I just had a thought. Um, as you know, the township owns the quarry field at the Willows but the farmer still farms it. So I became a nudge right after we bought that land because at that time he was using Roundup. Plus, unbelievable. I want, I'm wondering if a letter to John Rice who then communicates with a farmer wouldn't be better coming from the EAC rather than Sarah Pilling. Uh, I've done it every year in the spring. Uh, he is required by contract to list what he's going to use and when he's going to use it. He doesn't use it himself, he contracts. And we have gotten him way down. Well, part of his problem is the deer have been eating the soybeans, so he doesn't plant soybeans anymore. He only plants corn. But last year he was using paraquat and the bottom of that field is the Little Darby Creek, which we know is endangered. And I met a woman last summer, a grandmother, who had literally seen an American eel up at the top of the stream. So now we know that it does migrate. And I don't know whether you know the pattern of American eels. They spawn in the Sargasso Sea, which is God knows where, somewhere out in the Atlantic. The European eel and the American eel, they each, they don't interbreed, but they each spawn there. Then at a point at a very early age, the European eels go to Europe. The American eels come, so they've spawned in salt water, and they come up all the rivers on the east coast of the United States. So they're coming up the Delaware, and then they're coming up the freshwater creeks, and they look like a leaf when they come up. So when they rebuilt the bridge at the Willows Park, that bridge, all construction had to stop, mandated by the DEP. So they, she, she literally saw this eel. I mean, the contractor said he had seen it. It was towards the end of the summer, and they evolve up these freshwater creeks and then the magic moment, they go back down the freshwater, turn back into an eel, go into the Delaware, out into the ocean and they go back to the Sargasso Sea. That's amazing. It really is amazing. And An amazing and process. So I'm, I'm concerned, A, for the beekeeping and B, for this stream. But I'm just wondering if the EAC would be willing to write the letter, which has more clout than nudgy Sarah Pilling to do it, so that we can keep reducing the amount and the types of fertilizer. And he'll write back and say what it is, and then you have to do a little bit of research, sure. which, thank goodness for the internet, yeah. Um, you just pull the, the MSDS papers okay. to look at it, and then we write, write a letter. I've been sending it to the beekeeper to make sure that mm -hmm. the beekeeper who's up above the Skunk Hollow Garden, and he's a, a enema, PhD entomologist, so okay, he really great. knows what he's talking about. Great. And then we send a letter to John who sends it back to the farmer. Okay. Um, I think that would be appropriate. Any reactions, folks? Yeah, I think it's a good idea, too. Um, if you wouldn't mind helping us get our heads around how to do that, mm -hmm. um, 
be happy to you do whatever. Just send a letter to John and say it's spring. Please yep. contact the farmer and ask him what what pesticides and herbicides he intends to use this year. That's all John needs. And would this be a suggestion for him to, or, or encouragement for him to reduce the amount of pesticides, or are we trying to get him to eliminate the pesticides completely? Well, we'd love to get him to do it, but we analyze it and we pull right. the papers and we say this is, and it, it, we say this can be dangerous to fish, birds, or humans, mm -hmm. and it's going to become really crucial when and if the trail ever runs through that quarry field. Yeah because then you're going to have animals and humans. What's and the quarry field? The quarry field is that cornfield. You come up Newtown Road oh, okay. to the T, that, and the cornfield is right ahead of it, mm -hmm. and it goes down to the Little Darby Creek. My, my only thought is that if, not that I think writing a letter is too much pressure, but if ultimately the farmer decides to leave because he's not able to use the pesticides or it's not profitable for him, I'm wondering about what comes after that. If it, no one else wants that land, is it, it going to be more developments? No, it's, or? it's owned we, by the township. The, right, right. It's right, PLU. But, they can't sell they can't, it. Oh, they can't sell it. Oh, no, okay. They can't sell it. I wonder, though, if um, when we kind of get the list back, if there's anything we can do to suggest alternatives that might be less mm -hmm. toxic. Because I know mm -hmm. the township, we had a, a similar conversation about what they use on the edges of the Radnor Trail. Right. Um, and there was a product made out of oranges that they were using for a while, but they discontinued that. And then so they were using something that smelled like cinnamon. Mm -hmm. Right, 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 right. So there are alternatives. I don't know how yep. effective they are, but certainly. Um, it's a question of teaching him. I've met the gentleman, yep. and he's very nice. Yep. But he's been doing this for 30 years, mm -hmm. and we all get set in our ways. Sure. And Times have changed. Uh, the big news is he's no longer using Roundup. Yeah, well, which is great. And I, I'll also note that Monsanto and now Bayer um, is dealing with potential litigation over mm -hmm. this product. Mm -hmm. And it's not something that uh, I think is going to be around for too much longer. Yeah, the, it's really, really nasty well, stuff. Well, it's you know. in everything. Yeah. It's in wine, any wheat. In the United States, to harvest a wheat crop commercially, mm -hmm. they spray the fields a week before they harvest because it kills all the weeds and it makes the last wheat uh, be harvestable. Mm -hmm. So it's in all crackers, it's in all cere cereals. And what I find interesting is I'm a celiac, so I can't eat any wheat. But if I went to Europe, where it's smaller operations and they don't use Roundup, I could eat oh, bread. That's interesting. So the question is among celiacs, mm -hmm. are we allergic to wheat gluten or are we allergic to glyphosate? Wow. So it's a big issue, but I, if the EAC says no, we don't want to touch this, I'll keep writing the letter. I, I think it fits within our, our purview. I really do. And I mean, we're here for education. We don't necessarily have any enforcement power, but um, we can certainly... We can always write a letter and ask. Always write a letter. And yeah. suggest. Yeah. And, you know, it's, it's easy enough to write one letter, and then if we need to send a similar letter to someone else, we can do that. Mm -hmm. Not a bad idea. So thank you for bringing that up. Um, I'll make a note of it, and we'll, we'll work we'll together out next on steps. it. Yeah. Good. Uh, any old business? Any public comment? <laughs> Probably not. All right. Well, I think we're done. Thank you very much, everybody. Great to see you, and uh, we'll see you next month. Got it.